Fellow Rotarians, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speaker, Dr. Peter Carter, OBE, with warm rotary applause. Thank you. President, uh, Vice President, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been very interesting. This is my first ever experience uh, directly with Rotarians. I've got many friends who are Rotarians. And uh, before I get down to business, I just want to congratulate you on the wonderful work that you do throughout the world. The uh, uh, millions of people that have been helped um, over many, many countries. Um, and I think it's a tribute to all of you. So I, I wanted to start by saying that and to thank you for inviting me. Now, um, <coughs> I'm... I've been told to keep it to 20 minutes, and I will do that, and I'm going to take a walk through a range of issues, and I will leave some cards afterwards, particularly if somebody feels uncomfortable with what I say, and um, if you want to email me, we can keep the dialogue going. Um, just very briefly about me, um, in August of this year, I uh, left the Royal College of Nursing, uh, where I've been the Chief Executive. Uh, for just over eight and a half years. And before that, uh, for 12 years, I was the Chief Executive of the Central and North West London uh, Mental Health NHS Trust, which covered uh, a big part of London. Um, but what I really wanted to talk to you about uh, today was everybody in this room will have used health services, <coughs> whether the NHS or the private sector, and that would certainly uh, apply to our distinguished guests uh, from overseas. Um, the National Health Service in the UK, I still believe, is a very, very good healthcare system. But it is a healthcare system that is under enormous pressure and enormous strain. And there are a whole range of reasons for that. And when I was thinking uh, of <coughs> which particular parts to cut into today, uh, there are a, a number of things. Because whilst the reasons are so great, uh, it could fill a whole afternoon in talking about it. But there are a couple of areas that I, I want to concentrate on. The first thing is that within the United Kingdom, uh, people are living longer than ever, which of course is a very, very good thing. Uh, unfortunately, a huge proportion of the population that are living longer are not necessarily living longer healthier. And what I believe is one of the problems with the healthcare system in the UK is that over the decades, it has not evolved and adjusted in order to cope with the demands that that ageing population is making. So as I say, on one hand it's a very good thing, but on the other hand, if you don't configure services to help you cope with that, you end up with older people having a less than satisfactory experience of our healthcare system. And I was thinking about how best to demonstrate how the population across the four countries of the UK has changed over the decades. Uh, in 2012, um, some of you will recall, it was the 60th anniversary of Her Majesty the Queen coming to the throne. And in the week when most of the celebrations were taking place, I was asked to give a, a speech to uh, an Alzheimer's Awareness uh, Society. And um, I, I looked up um, how many people in 1952 in the UK lived to be a hundred. And the reason I did that was I'm sure people will remember there was a time when the king or queen of the day personally signed a telegram uh, that was delivered on a little motorbike uh, to anybody that was a hundred mm. and it was a cause of great celebration. Uh, in 1952, the year the queen came to the throne, <coughs> 350 people in that year lived to be a hundred. So it was an incredibly rare event. It didn't even happen once a day. Now, bearing in mind I was giving this speech in 2012, I looked up how many people in 2011 lived to be 100. And do you know where that 350 had become? 5,000. 12,000. Oh, yes. hmm. It was 12,000 people in 2011 lived to be 100. So in 60 years, we've gone from something that was an incredibly rare event that something that is so common <coughs> When was the last time you saw a major celebration for somebody being 100 in your local newspapers or on your radio or on television? Nowadays, it simply doesn't happen. 
Uh, by the way, I can assure you that Her Majesty the Queen does not sign 12,000 telegrams. <laughs> She's now got a computer and a team of four that do her for it. Last year, it was 15,000 people lived to be 100. So ages of 105 are now not uncommon. Now the issue is that whilst of course it's a very good thing, we have not evolved our services in order to help us cope with that. And far too often, however well intended, you find people, particularly in nursing homes and care homes, that are essentially being warehoused. And people sit there hour after hour with very little stimulation and with minimal care. It's not the fault of the individual care workers, it is a system that has failed to adjust. Now in addition to that, we have the phenomena of people living with long-term conditions and the whole range of long-term conditions, and we've made enormous progress over the years. But with a growing population and more and more people living long with long-term conditions, what we need to do is to develop more specialist services to help those people. Now, some of the things that you will be very familiar with, I'm sure, because uh, certainly in the distinguished company in this room, you read your newspapers and you're in touch with the media. We have the phenomena in the UK of lifestyle-induced illnesses and conditions. We now have record levels of type 2 diabetes. Always very careful to distinguish between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, anybody can have, the most healthiest person in the world can have. Steve Redgrave, who won all those Olympic mm. gold medals, yeah. he is a type 1 diabetic. Type 2 is lifestyle-induced. People, poor diet, lack of exercise, very obese. And what are the consequences of this? Well, the consequence of the obesity crisis, and excuse the metaphor, is that many of our health services are literally collapsing under the weight of that obesity crisis. And we have to be prepared to do something about it. Now, what do you get with type 2 diabetes? Well, you get diabetic retinopathy, blindness. You get cardiac problems. You get renal problems and you get circulatory problems. As a consequence of type 2 diabetes, more and more younger people are having lower limb amputations. The current rate is this, is that there are 135 amputations per week, or 7,000 people a year are losing either their toes, their feet, or their lower limbs as a result of type 2 diabetes. Wholly avoidable. Now, as well as that being very distressing and putting a huge strain on the capacity of the services to cope, the money that that's costing is about £10 billion per annum. £10 billion, not million, £10 billion. Now, with a health service that is struggling, you have to say, isn't that an absolute national tragedy that all of this money is being expended when with a moderate adjustment to lifestyle, it could almost be wholly avoidable? Liver disease. Now, I am a great patriot, and I love my country, and I am a great supporter of the United Kingdom, uh, but the reality is many parts of our communities are having a real problem, a real relationship problem with alcohol. All over Western Europe, liver disease is dropping quite dramatically, apart from two countries, which I'm so pleased it's not Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say. Uh, it's the UK and Finland, yeah. okay, so you're not too far away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, younger and younger people <coughs> presenting to alcohol clinics. Um, on the back of the 24-hour drinking, do you remember 20 years oh, ago yeah. when we thought we were going to have a, a cafe style, the cafe mm. culture? Mm. Unfortunately, in the UK, we just seem to have filled the space. And now we have younger and younger people presenting with liver disease that hitherto you would have associated with men who'd been drinking 30, 40, maybe 50 years. The upshot of that is something like 5,000 people a year are dying through alcohol-related uh, illnesses. It's costing the NHS at least £3.5 billion pounds a year. These are massive sums of money, and we have to do something about it in order to address, as I say, these uh, lifestyle-induced conditions. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to depress you by the end of this, but I don't buy it. If, if you want me to say something mean or full, let's cut to the chase and you're not going to get motherhood and apple pie. The next thing that I want to, and then it follows on, is childhood obesity. You know, September, just a couple of months ago, 10% of all children 
entering primary school in the UK were overweight. And I'm not talking of a few pounds. I'm talking about a significant problem. By the time they leave a primary school, 20% are overweight. And what does that lead to? Again, illness throughout life. Lack of exercise, poor diet, uh, all sorts of problems. Yeah. And last year I was visiting um, a hospital in South Wales that looks after the Valley community. And again, it's a community like many parts of the UK where it's got high socio-economic <coughs> deprivation, hasn't recovered from the demise of the mining yeah. industries and steel and so on. And I was talking to the nurses and asking them about their biggest challenges and there were a range of challenges. But one of the things that they said, which really surprised me, is they said it's just so depressing the number of children that get admitted with dental decay. Uh, and as a consequence of the problem uh, with some of the children in those communities, every September, nurses go into schools and they give out free toothbrushes and toothpaste and introduce many of the children to dental hygiene. So this is Britain in the second decade of the 21st century, and you just have children who have not been used to cleaning their teeth. And that made me look up uh, how many children across the country were admitted. And last year, 46,500 children were admitted to hospital and had to have general anaesthetics as a result of dental decay. And whilst poor health is often connected with low socioeconomic status, I have to say, that's got nothing to do with that at all. Toothbrushes and toothpaste are very, very cheap. It's a fact that unfortunately a section of our society are not introducing children to the very simple thing of cleaning your teeth uh, tw twice a day. We also have issues to do with the lack of specialist nurses. Um, and last year, um, £43 million was expended on unnecessary admissions to hospital for, for people with multiple sclerosis. <coughs> and with proper specialist nursing, that many of those people simply didn't need to be admitted to hospital. So what I'm bringing together here, it's still a great health service. It's still something to be very proud of, free at the point of delivery, irrespective of the ability to pay. But it's a health service that needs to change. And one of the things we have to do is to get upstream and start to address the lifestyle-induced illnesses and conditions, which I say in so many cases are wholly preventable. There is no reason why 46,500 children had to have a general anaesthetic on admission to hospital for tooth decay. The Labour government did put a lot of money into the health service, but unfortunately they wasted an opportunity yeah. because they kept spending the, same, the, the money in the same way they did um, before. Now we're in difficult economic uh, 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 times. It makes service redesign that much more difficult, but we certainly have to do it. The one thing I do want to say, however, and I'm very conscious of the time, but I've just a few minutes left, is people often talk to me and say, well, you know, nurses don't care anymore. I thoroughly uh, reject that notion. Um, people say to me, why are we recruiting overseas? Why don't people in the United Kingdom want to be nurses? Well, in case there's any misunderstanding, let me be absolutely clear. The NHS has recruited from overseas since the early 1950s, and we're incredibly grateful that people, particularly from the Commonwealth <laughs> countries, want to come here and nurse. But there is something wrong with the system Last year, there were 20,000 training places. There were 57,000 applicants. So the notion that people don't want to be nurses is an absolutely ill-founded concept. People want to be nurses. The problem is, we, when I say we, the government, since May 2010, cut back drastically on the number of training places. In 2003, we were training 23,000 nurses. That dropped in May 2010 to 17,000. As a result of losing those 6,000 nurses a year, we're now in, in trouble. It's now back to 20,000, still less than 2003. And we will be dependent on overseas recruitment for many years to come. And I do want to stress, and nothing at all wrong with people from overseas, but isn't it immoral that we have cut back our training programs that do not train people in the UK, and we are going off to developing countries Africa, uh, India, many Far East countries, raiding their impoverished nursing workforce to bail out the shortfall because of our short-term funding. 
So there are the range of uh, just a, a, a snapshot of some of the issues that are, are facing us. I again want to thank you for inviting me. I hope that's been of some interest to you. And as I say, um, I think we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, and if not, I'll leave some cards. So if anybody wants to follow through, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Leaving aside the lifestyle issues for the moment, what do you think of the junior doctors? dispute with the NHS Well, I, I have every sympathy with the junior doctors. Um, a junior doctor earns £23,000 a year. And I would say, by most people's standards in this day and age, that is a very poor salary. I mean, someone said to me, a nurse is up for seven-day working. And as I said rather inelegantly, well, who the hell do you think works every weekend Who's going to be working Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, New Year's Eve? New Year? It'll be nurses, doctors, and our colleagues in many other disciplines. Isn't one of our problems that we're trying to get our health service basically on the cheap? The, the feeling one gets in general that it's terribly expensive. In fact, if you look at the amount spent per GDP in the United States, it's over 14%. Yeah, the image given is that this is a profligate and wasteful health service. Now, there, there is waste and inefficiency, um, but overall, it's a very effective healthcare system because, as you've said, we pay less as our, our percentage of our GDP than virtually every Western European country. The Scandinavians spend more than us, as you say, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal, the Republic of Ireland all pay more than us. I think the best organisations are those that have a high level of people that come from a clinical background uh, in the, the senior echelons of the management. Um, and by doing that, I think you have a better feel for what goes on. Having said that, I know plenty of people who do not come from a clinical background that make highly effective chief executives and senior managers. The trick is, is to have a fusion of the two. I mean, I do a lot of work with the military. Um, and no matter what a rank you see, uh, you know, the, the chief of the defence staff has come through the ranks and understands the issues facing soldiers. I think if you have someone that comes from an environment where they've not had that, they can't identify with it. I actually think that's a problem with some of our politicians nowadays, mm -hmm. is that they come out of university, they go straight into a think tank, uh, they then get a seat, uh, and what they haven't had is what you might call a proper job. And, and for me, the best politicians are those that have been out there, of, of all parties, that have actually had, you know, got their hands dirty running uh, or working in the service. How do you feel um, their diet um, should be integrated with their treatment? Well, um, Flo, uh, food is as critical as any drug I or surgical, surgical intervention. And where I think, and again, I'm not being critical of the individual nurses and healthcare assistants, but far too often with older people, you can have a situation where someone, let's say, has been a, a, a pretty active 86-year-old, has fallen over, breaks their hip, comes in, has a hip replacement, and within a few days is going downhill very quickly. And relatives will say, mum or dad was fine, but a couple of days in the hospital they went down. And often the reason is this, is that to help an older people who's unwell with their lunch takes a bespoke nurse or care assistant to sit there for some time. And, and I believe what the government should be doing is have a highly effective, proactive public health campaign, really taking it out there. Because what I've said about the longevity that we've currently got, a lot of people are predicting that the current generation will not live as long mm -hmm. as their parents. Mm -hmm. Yep, because of this lifestyle-induced illnesses. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the club, Peter, I would like to say thank you so much, firstly, for coming and sharing so much factual information, which I think has been rather thought-provoking for all of us, thinking about lifestyle and, and how we can actually take that forward in our community work as well. So thank you very much, and we have a speaker's certificate to share with you, which hopefully will remind you of Rotary. Thank, thank you. Very much, Thank you.